right. So it is my pleasure to introduce Sebastian on this, the day of his PhD defense. So Sebastian started his PhD in 2014 after completing a bachelor's degree in biology and applied physics from the University of Miami. He spent some time there working on, as a research assistant on a project that focused on cooperative behaviors in birds, African weaver birds, which I think sort of got, got him really interested in, in the study of animal behavior. So Sebastian came to, his, uh, came to Pitt and began his PhD in the Morehouse lab but migrated to my lab when Nate's lab moved to the University of Cincinnati. And Nate has continued to be an important collaborator and mentor for Sebastian. And thus, after I'm done talking, I'll hand over the floor to Nate um, to say a few things before we let Sebastian take over. Um, so as many of you know, my lab is primar pr primarily works on frogs and Sebastian's passion is for spiders but we share a common interest in our fascination with the diversity of ways that animals have evolved to communicate with one another. So the fascinating colors and dance moves of the spiders that you'll hear about today and the poison frogs that we study in my lab have both been shaped by the need to communicate with potential mates. Sebastian's dissertation, as he'll explain, fills an important gap in our understanding of animal communication. Um, and uh, the experiments that Sebastian will share with you today were designed and executed, I think, to a standard that is exemplary in the field of animal behavior. And indeed, he's published some of these experiments in top journals in that field, including behavioral ecology. But Sebastian is also an incredibly talented writer, and his ability to synthesize the state of knowledge and identify key directions for future research, um, to me, means that the review chapter he's included in his dissertation is poised to make an important impact on the future of research in his field as well. Second only to Sebastian's passion for spiders perhaps is his passion for science education and science communication, especially when applied to what we in academia call informal learning situations. So for example, Sebastian is an accomplished science journalist. He spent this past summer as a staff writer for the Philadelphia Inquirer and a mass media fellow with the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's got a long list of contributions to that and other mass media outlets. He's designed and led countless activities for children in the public and developed partnerships with a, a large number of local informing, informal learning partners, including many of our local museums and schools here in Pittsburgh. And perhaps more than any other student I've advised, Sebastian has been tremendously generous with his time as a mentor, both formally mentoring through department and professional society programs and informally by training undergraduates in association with the research in my lab and Nate's. In recognition of Sebastian's many talents, he's received numerous fellowships and grants, including pretty much the entire list of grants that this university um, has to give to its graduate students. Before I hand over the stage to Nate, I wanna end by saying that it has been an absolute pleasure to have Sebastian in our lab the ideas, the passion, the camaraderie that he's brought to our lab will be sorely missed and impossible to replace. I couldn't be prouder of Sebastian and all that he has accomplished. Nate? Thanks, Corey. Um, I just want to add a few things to that really impressive list of accomplishments that Corey has described so, so ably. Uh, Sebastian is a lot of different things. For those of you who have come to know him, you realize he's a really multifaceted person. He's, he's artistic, he's an, an itinerant doodler. I've come to really appreciate the little doodles that he leaves in various places in the lab, even after he's been gone. Um, he's fashionable. Uh, he brought uh, something of a post-apocalyptic chic to our field team with his gear, which we really stepped up our field game, and I always appreciated that. Uh, he's clever at constructing devices uh, and new ways of doing research, uh, and that has been really essential because of the small size of the animals that he has been studying, and he's really excelled in that. But the thing that I want to highlight the most is Sebastian's joyful appreciation of life. Um, it, this is con a contagious thing about Sebastian. It's unflappable. It infuses his approach to science, to science communication, to teaching. It was 
this joyful appreciation and enthusiasm for life that was our first point of contact when I met with him as a prospective graduate student in perhaps the most depressing office my career has ever seen, which was the back of a windowless basement lab <laughs> at the far end of a labyrinth. And yet Sebastian and I just got going about our excitement about spiders and about living things and about communication in a way that really just brightened my entire day and led to continued conversations about um, his, his desire to work in my lab. Um, it's also something that has made him a lot of friends around the world. And I notice as people are checking in to Sebastian's Zoom presentation here that he has spider enthusiasts, spider biologists, animal communication experts, uh, science communicators from around the world with us today. And that's tribute not only to Sebastian's um, excellence in science, but also the infectiousness of his joy about the living world. And so I couldn't be more proud in Sebastian that he's come to this important moment here that he is succeeded at producing a really fascinating and deep thesis. And I couldn't be more confident that he'll take this joy onto the new and exciting things that he does next. So that's what I have to share. And I'm looking forward to Sebastian telling all of you about what he's been working on these past uh, several years. Great. Thank you both. <laughs> um, and now it's my turn to share. Okay, let's do this. Uh, can everyone see the presentation slide without a gray bar or anything like that? Looks good. Whew, okay. It's a little not fair to make me tear up like that, but let's get, let's get this party started. Um, so hi, everybody. I wanted to thank you all for coming to my PhD defense today. Um, it's been a long six years, and it's been a really exciting uh, path to understanding more about how animals uh, talk to each other. And I hope that by the end of today, you'll have some appreciation of that and maybe start thinking about it in your life, too. Um, so with no further ado, and thank you both to Nate and Corey for their wonderful and very heartfelt introductions, um, I'd like to start telling you a bit about my PhD research, about how animals, uh, the, excuse me, about the constraints that animals have on effective communication and how they solve that with uh, their behavior during communication. So I want to start off with a really... Uh, motivating and but also kind of simple observation that communication is really important to a variety of key ecological tasks. Uh, mate choice, territory defense, um, social coordination, avoiding predators, getting information from one individual to another is at the heart of that. And we see in uh, the natural world that there's an amazing diversity of both the signals that animals have and the ways they use them. And so one of the questions that research has been trying to answer for quite some time is, what are the selective factors, what are the challenges to overcome that is driving this diversity that we see before us today? And I want to break this down into two big challenges that uh, signaling traits, so the design of the signals themselves and how animals use them, their behavior, face when trying to communicate. Um, and those are broadly sorted into strategic design questions. So what am I going to say and how am I actually going to get that message across with my signal? And then efficacy challenges, which is how do I do this efficiently? Um, the greatest chance that I'll, someone will pay attention to me and that my message will get heard. And these two factors, these two challenges lead to selection on signaling traits. Um, and the combination of the two is driving, uh, in generally, the evolution of, of animal communication. Um, and so I want to give you an idea of what these two things mean. So focusing first on strategic design, this is a question of when there's, you know, in the hypothetical guppy with color patches, these could all be, um, what are these able to say? How do they function as signals? So there might be a relationship between the colors used and the condition of the signaler that needed to produce those signals. And therefore, the signal might be a message of high quality 
um, in orange, where that uh, color actually increases with body condition and not so with blue might not be a effective challenge, effective signal in that case, or it might not, excuse me, not, might not work in that situation. And so we would expect that selection will, will favor signals that get that message across um, and perhaps in this case, help that individual mate. And so the more orange colors will be selected for over time. And so that's a, a signal, a strategic challenge. There's also efficacy challenges, talking about communicating efficiently. So once again, we can imagine these two fish, again, vary in their uh, coloration. And this time, both of them are reliable indicators of rival ways of conveying information about body condition. Um, but the situation that the animals are in their environment might make it so that one of the colors is more easily detectable than the other. And that orange fish might actually be more noticeable and therefore be in time selected for to use this color in order to communicate because it's more easily noticeable by the, the receiver. It's a more efficient way to, to say the same thing. And so these two factors, um, I want to just make sure to point out, they do work together. They're not um, alternate or competing uh, modes of, of challenges or modes of selection. Uh, but today I really want to focus on efficacy challenges because there's been a lot of research on the relationship between a signal, what a signal looks like and what message it's trying to say. Um, we've been studying that for a really long time, but there are a lot of really fascinating new questions that are coming up recently about how animals communicate most efficiently. And so I want to start off with something that's going to sound, to get this point across, really, really basic. Um, but it's going to lead us to this huge unknown in animal communication. And that is the simple idea that I'm sure you'll get that to communicate a message to you, I need to show it to you and you need to look. And that's it. This here is the fundamental challenge because positioning, so whether or not we are facing each other or not, is going to make is going to be a make and break difference between whether my message gets across or you never know which spiders are best and like that's not a way you want to go through life. Um, and while this feels really intuitive for humans because we do this literally every day of our lives. Um, we and it sounds like oh well of course this is something that happens that we you know look at a signal and and I show it to you, but how often have you tried to show something to your friends your parents your kids and found that they're not fully paying attention. They're looking somewhere else, they're looking at their phone. You had a challenge that you had to solve with your behavior or by changing your signal. There was some selective pressure on you to act to improve how effectively you could communicate. And that is the fundamental challenge to efficient communication um, that not only humans face, but animals face. And so in a naturalist environment where, uh, um, individuals vary in how well they can position themselves during communication. Behaviors that lead to us both looking at each other when I'm trying to show you a message will be, we would expect those to be selected for. Um, but what exactly are the, the kind of the underpinnings that make this such a big issue? And how does selection shape how animals position themselves? you might be surprised to know that despite how intuitive it is for humans that we need to do this to talk to each other, we know very, very little about how animals move around during communication, whether or not they're looking at each other, how big of a problem is this. Basically, most studies have looked at communication, or at least historically, the way that I'm showing you to right now. Here's a signal. Let's measure its shape or its color, and let's relate it to something about that animal. It's a static uh, conception of communication. And uh, in doing so, we've ignored this huge challenge that animals need to overcome, and therefore we are missing out on a lot of the ways that selection could be acting on what animals are doing during communication. And so in my PhD research that I'll be sharing with you today, I want to first go through the reasoning uh, and the, the physiological and physical underpinnings of why position matters. Um, reviewing this across animal communication, though I'll have to be a little constrained in my breath for time. Um, feel free to ask me about that at the end. And then I want to go into 
uh, my experimental work with this wonderful system of Habernatus jumping spiders, where I try to fill in some of the knowledge gaps, try to get a sense of the really simple question to ask, how are animals positioning themselves during communication and what are the consequences of that? And following this, that'll be my first big experiment that I'll be sharing with you. I wanted to ask, what can animals do about the positioning of the other individual? So can signalers do something to control what's going on with the receiver? Um, and how do they um, handle challenges to doing so? These environmental conditions that I'll discuss when we get to that point in the talk. So I want to start off with um, the basics. Why does positioning matter? So I've said there's some relationship between how animals position themselves, that is their location relative to each other and their orientation relative to each other and the efficiency or the efficacy, you'll hear me use both of those words. Um, there's kind of a, a not, efficiency, efficacy and effectiveness is a whole word bubble in the literature. And for the, today's purposes, you can think about them similar as similar things. Uh, but there's a relationship here between positioning and efficacy. And the question is, okay, what is it and why is it there? And what I'd like to share with you today is this idea of directionality, of both signals and sensors having directional biases and how well they work that's going to interact with positioning and affect the efficiency of communication. So here's another simple concept that uh, I think we'll get, but is huge. Signals are directional. That is, when I'm looking at something and I look at it from a different angle, it can change, the appearance of that signal can change completely. And I'll be talking about these things in terms of visual communication, but um, if you have questions about other modalities, please save those for the end. So this, uh, this is obvious to us, you know, we show people things, we aim it at them, um, but this is something that all animals have to deal with. And there's a, this relationship between how, what a signal, uh, how a signal is designed, what it's kind of, how it works, and how directional it is. And signals, we can roughly uh, categorize them from being weakly to strongly directional based on their properties, how much their appearance changes um, based on viewing angle. And there are some kind of uh, attributes of a signal, signal's design that might influence that. So simple or repeating patterns uh, that kind of cover a whole, uh, uh, that wrap around an entire animal's body that can be seen from multiple sides will most likely be weakly directional. You'll be able to get some of that signal from different perspectives. But if you have a spatially complex signal or a signal that is asymmetric, like cuttlefish do when they display a signal on one side of their body and camouflage on the other side of their body, um, or something that is on an approximately flat surface so that when it is turned, it can no longer be viewed. Um, or the famous example of iridescent signals, color signals that change their color based on viewing angle. These things, uh, signals with these properties will likely be strongly directional and there will be a big change in what a receiver can get out of that uh, display depending on where they are looking at it from. And on the other side of this is the idea that sensory systems are also directional. So you know this, your eyes have a limited field of view. Outside of a certain range of vision from certain directions, you can't see what's going on. And this is gonna vary in a species specific way, but I'll focus on humans because we know a lot about their vision in particular. It's not just that you have a limit, a hard limit to your vision. Within that range, your, the distribution of the types and density of your photoreceptors is actually gonna change uh, across your retina. And that's because doing different types of visual tasks requires different types of machinery. And so evolutionarily, you've had to compromise and compartmentalize your vision. Um, and the way this looks is if you unroll a human eye seen here kind of flat, um, you'll see that the density of rods and cones, things that see um, a brightness and color respectively, vary very much from your periphery to your center. What does this mean functionally? It means that where things are in your field of view 
is going to determine what kind of information you can get out of them. So for us to see color, the object has to be within about 60 degrees or so of our central field of view. Um, outside of that, your brain will want to make you look there and track that object and re remember its color. But if something new pops into your field of view, uh, you won't know what color it is until it crosses into this area where you can actually detect that information. So that means if I'm turning around when I'm, someone's trying to show me something, what I can see of within that signal is also changing. And if you really want to get into this, there's a wonderful web comic by XKCD that lets you really dive deep into the, the heterogeneity of your visual field, how your visual ability changes depending on where things are. So putting these two factors together, effective communication, so whether what a receiver sees, whether it's this black drab uh, gorget on this uh, um, hummingbird, or if they see the bright, wonderful iridescent purple is gonna depend on whether these two directional factors line up or align with each other or not, or to the degree that they do. And that's something that I'll be calling signal alignment throughout the talk. So positioning, to return to our question of why positioning matters, the directionality of a signal is gonna, is gonna affect how much a receiver needs to aim it at their, their uh, target and how well they do that along with how a receiver looks at that signal, how much they, they keep it in their field of view to get that information, is gonna be measured by signaling alignment, and that is going to determine what information gets across from one individual to another, how efficiently that happens. So because of this relationship, we can imagine that if we animals are in a situation where they're selected for getting information across efficiently, there might be selection on how signalers position themselves to best get that chance that the receiver will see things, and maybe also on how receivers position themselves so that they can most effectively evaluate the signals that are coming near, coming at them, and then make a decision. And so this is something that's likely under selection, but we know very, very little about even the fundamental things of how animals are positioning themselves. So in this slide here, I've marked things with dotted lines where there's limited information about how visual uh, about their role in um, the efficiency of visual communication. So we know a little bit about signal or positioning and signal directionality um, from some studies. I mean, there's some evidence in a few systems that signalers are aiming their signals towards receivers. But while we know about how eyes uh, work at depending on their angle, we know very, very little about how receivers position themselves. It's something that's been studied um, very rarely. And so that means that we don't know anything that depends on that. We don't know how often these two biases line up or align with each other. And that means we don't know how effectively information is getting across in most situations. So the next thing that uh, I'd like to show you is my uh, research where I try to fill in these lines that are highlighted in yellow uh, and fill in some of that information gap there with my research on the Havronatus pyrethrix jumping spiders. So I'll move on to the, my next chapter, looking at this basic idea of how animals position themselves and what are the consequences. consequences. And so I studied this, um, oh, excuse me, there is this unspoken thing that I've alluded to, which is this idea that animals are just communicating effectively all the time, so we don't need to worry about it. And it's not a hypothesis that has been written down as far as I know, but it is something that is implicit in the way that people have studied or not studied, in this case, certain aspects of animal communication. So this hypothesis of mutual optimization is saying that both animals are positioning themselves to optimize how well that signal gets across. So it predicts that behavior positioning is gonna increase signaling alignment throughout communication and that we have consistent alignment. So signals are, we're looking at head on both cases uh, throughout communication. This is something that has been assumed and not tested. Um, and now I'm gonna test it. So the system that I use to uh, study this is the fiery haired paradise jumping spider, Habronatus pyrethrix. These are wonderful, tiny little spiders um, that are quite colorful and, and um, charismatic. And the males put on this wonderful courtship display 
for the females. It's a dance where they start at a long range display where they're waving their arms and they will move into a short range display with where there's more of a sit and deliver. Um, there's some knee pop action and then he'll do some really fast wavings of his arms um, before attempting to copulate with the feet. And so this is a system where um, this is not only, males are not only fighting or dancing for the chance to mate, they are dancing to avoid being eaten because females are often larger and sexual cannibalism is a common thing in this and other spiders. And so that pressure on saying, hey, mate with me, don't eat me, um, is one of the reasons that I thought that the system was a really interesting way to, uh, to study um, efficacy challenges. And so the, the, what I wanted to look at is color communication because color signals in this system are really important and they have this like really strict requirement on signaling alignment. Um, so why are these color, why is coloration important? Well, male's red color that you can see on his face there is actually a, uh, going to affect how easily he can approach a female and get into those later stages of courtship that are needed to attempt a copulation. So if you take, uh, you put some makeup on a jumping spider and get rid of its red face, it no longer can approach females as easily and therefore will have a harder time progressing through courtship. So this is something that's critical to that approach um, beginning of courtship. But the problem, one of them, is that male coloration is forward facing. It's on the front facing part of their body. So if they turn sideways, you can no longer see those wonderful reds. Likewise, color vision in jumping spiders is also directional, even more so than it is in humans. Um, to understand why, we'll have, we're going to take a look inside of this female jumping spider's head and see how her eyes work or see some differences in how they work. So this wonderful cryo section by our undergraduate, John Gote, uh, shows that jumping spiders have different eyes and they are built differently. So the two primary eyes seen here, these big ones, are the only ones that can see in color. The other ones cannot. So the spider has this really interesting visual field where 60 degrees approximately in front of their head, they can see high resolution and color in particular, and the rest of their field of view, they can still see, but it is actually a black and white and a lower resolution kind of motion detection system. So that means that if a male wants to show off his coloration to approach a female, or in a female wants to evaluate that male, their, uh, their positioning is going to determine how well they can do that. The difference between being blurry and black and white or in bright color and crisp um, is going to be the degree of signaling alignment. And so what I studied in my research is two main questions here. How often does this actually happen? How often are males' colors visible? And how is that pattern of alignment determined by how each individual is moving in the situation. So to study this, what I did is we filmed courtship of jumping spiders from above. Um, and you can see a little bit here that there, you, these animals are not standing in place the whole time. They are moving and they're turning around. They're, they're, it's a dynamic situation. So from a lot of footage, like, uh, like those, what you see here, we digitized it and then we started calculating um, where these animals were in their other uh, in the their respective other spiders field of view. So to measure signal alignment, we looked at based on the body axis, these animals, their eyes are basically the, the hard limits of their vision are fixed by their head width. So where their head is facing tells you where that 60 degree cone of, of color vision is. Um, and so we can measure signal alignment by the male's position within the female's field of view. And we measure this every uh, fifth of a second. Um, the reason that we didn't, um, we're gonna uh, show you all this data with respect to the female because we found very quickly that males are 97% of the time beaming that signal right at the female. They are locked onto her. So what we'll show you, is, or what I'll show you, is a distribution of males' position within the female's field of view. So that will look kind of like a bar chart, but wrapped around a circle. Um, with respect to the female's midline. Again, that's the center of uh, where she can see color. And we describe this, this distribution by how strong it is, the, the vector length. You see a little arrow there. 
um, as well as the angle. So where on average is the male relative to the female in her field of view? So if we expect um, high alignment or strong alignment as seen by, as predicted by the mutual optimization hypothesis is an implicit assumption, we should see something like this. Females look at males, males sit in front of females, easy. What actually happens? So when we look at the data, we see this interesting pattern of uh, a difference between the two uh, phases of courtship, long range display and short range display. Where in long range display, um, females are basically looking pretty much randomly throughout. They're only very slightly uh, looking at the male more than other things. In fact, the, they're mostly looking directly away from him. And we see that this changes uh, uh, when males move into short range display. But so overall, this is only 27% of, of the time are females actually looking throughout the entire courtship, are they actually looking at the male and seeing him in color? And this occurs almost exclusively during short range courtship and not during that approach phase where we know the red coloration is important. So the next question was, okay, who, who's in charge of this pattern? What is determining what we see here? So we asked what males do when females are stationary. To take female motion out of the equation, we use these, they're pinned dead female models and we let males court and see what they did, how they position themselves uh, just by their own whims. Um, and so we can compare this with uh, the results you saw before with the mobile or live female on the top and then the stationary female on the bottom. And we see that without female movement, males are just going right in front of her and they are aligning their signals with her field of view pretty well. So that suggests that female movement is what is disrupting this alignment throughout courtship. Um, and so the next question was, okay, can males you know, reposition themselves in response to females looking away? Um, because that might be uh, some way that they can recover uh, having their colors being seen. So what we did is we turned female models away after males had begun their short range courtship. And we asked what males did afterwards. Did they stay in place or did they reposition themselves? So how did males respond when females turned away uh, and looked in the opposite direction? So we see that males, this is their final positions shown here. Some of them do circle around the female, but no one actually ends up back in front of her. So male movement is not enough to make up for females looking away. And so from this taken together, we can answer our question about the, the patterns of when signals are visible and why. Um, contrary to what is the ongoing assumption in a lot of animal in research where we do, positioning isn't considered, both individuals are moving around a lot during courtship and signaling alignment is actually really rare. It's only 27% of the entire communication interaction on average. Males are aiming their displays toward females, but females are moving around and disrupting alignment by looking away from males. And males do not reposition themselves enough to reestablish that alignment. So we see that signaler that this is the patterns of whether or not a signal is visible is driven by what the receiver is doing and not necessarily what the signaler is doing. And so we can update what we know about the relationships between positioning and directionality and efficacy based on this study. Receivers often disrupt alignment and that might lead to problems because now what are males going to do in order to be, have their signals be visible? And this is what I uh, asked in my next uh, experimental chapter of my PhD, where I'm asking, okay, males have a problem. They are not able to be seen. What can they do to control how the receiver is moving? Because they clearly are not moving themselves in order to, to solve this problem. So can males do something that gets a female to turn around and look at them? Well, in long range courtship, we see that males do this arm waving display. It's basically uh, the bread and butter of long range courtship. And we hypothesized that males might be using this to attract a female's attention. Because if you remember, females field of view for motion detection is actually 360 degrees, more or less, 
That is, if she's facing away from him, she can still see him moving, and that might be interesting or, um, and get her to turn around and look at him. And so we asked, uh, sorry, we asked that question about how the signalers can do that. And we also wanted to add a little bit of, uh, we, we wanted to, to see what animals are doing in a more naturalistic setting. Because you, as you've seen so far, we've been showing you these animals in a plain white lab background, but that's not a realistic situation. As we saw with our Guppy example from the very beginning, the background, what is in the visual environment of this animal can actually affect how well a signal works. And so one of the questions that we had was, well, if there's something, is there something behind a male like the rapidly moving grass of their, the wind windblown grasslands where they're found in the wild, um, does that make their, their own movement less noticeable? And if so, what can they do about it? So we asked to, to study these two questions together, uh, we did this kind of uh, combination of video presentation experiments. So first we asked, how well do waving displays work to attract female attention? And how does this value vary with properties of the actual wave itself and the environment that's behind them, the visual background? So we made animated males that uh, varied in their amplitude and velocity to fully cover and exceed the observed range of natural variation that you see plotted here. And then we presented this to females in a choice experiment um, on different backgrounds that varied in how complex they were from a simple gray background all the way to a fast moving uh, grass recorded at their natural environment. And after this, we're gonna talk about what males did in the converse experiment, um, but I'll focus on the first experiment uh, where females are choosing between looking at waving versus non-waving males. Uh, they are on, they see these two males on a screen and they can try to look at one or the other, the one that's more interesting. Um, we did this with these animations, as I mentioned before, that varied in 10 levels of amplitude, so how big of a movement, and then velocity, how fast of a movement. Um, across four backgrounds uh, that went from quote unquote lab conditions, which is a plain gray, to a photo from the animal's environment taken at the capture site of a female, um, and then a video taken at that same location, and then that video increased to 1.5 times speed to really um, make it both more uh, spatially complex and then uh, uh, more temporally complex, have more movement. So we're on a spectrum from simple to very complicated backgrounds that might make male signals um, less noticeable. We did this, ends up being, if you do it for 40 spiders for 400 stimuli, turns out to be 400 hours of watching spiders, watching spiders, which as I will say later, I could not have done without the help of many, many dedicated undergraduate scientists. Um, how do you get a spider to watch a screen for 400 hours? Um, well, each spider only watched 40 hours, but anyway, um, or 10 hours. You glue a tiny magnet on their heads, uh, and then you abduct them with a metal rod. And you take that metal rod, and you give the spider a little ball, and you place it in front of our clockwork orange video presentation display. And you give them a little ball with little dots that you paint on it. And when the spider wants to look at something, they will try to turn, but their head is fixed in place by the metal rod. So instead what happens, is that the ball turns, and from that movement in a video that you're filming this, you can categorize what they are trying to look at, which of these two stimuli. So what did we find out? So the most basic question, are these things working to get a female's attention? So we have net orientations towards a waving male. Um, that means the amount he, she did to the waving male minus the amount that she did to the stationary male. Um, with a value of zero meaning equal uh, attention to both. And we see that the waving displays are really effective at getting a female to turn towards them, far more so than just a male in courtship position. Does this depend on properties of that signal itself? So we looked at the amplitude here on the x-axis. We didn't see any effect velocity, so I'm not showing you that data, but going from small waves to big waves and then Pri on the y-axis, we have a priority effect. Whether a female looks at the waving male first and then the other one, or looks at the other male first and then the waving male. And we see this 
uh, there's a typo gives it the slight but significant advantage of really big waves um, that are going to get noticed first. Females are going to look at that first before looking at something else. So that this priority effect. What about the visual environment? Well, when we look at how many times a female looks towards the again the waving male and the non now the waving male on top and the non-waving male on the bottom y-axis is the number on average of times she turns to look at them we see that as the environment gets more complex as movement is introduced females are less responsive they are statistically less likely to just look at anything um, but there's this really interesting result where the waving males attract a greater proportion of her attention so when her attention is limited, they're actually doing a better job of getting her to turn and look at them. So these signals are actually a really possibly powerful tool for males to control where a female is facing during communication. But this was with uh, animated males. How do uh, living live regular males deal with the challenges that we just saw background, vi the visual environment is decreasing a female's responsiveness, how likely she is to look at something. Well, to test this, we did a kind of reciprocal experiment where we had males dance in an arena that was surrounded by three cam or four cameras, four, cam four cameras, and three video monitors where we can manipulate their visual environment and then film them from multiple angles to see what they were doing. And this is an example of that footage. And what um, we, and I say we, this, the, the, a lot of the, um, the 3D reconstruction that you see here was uh, done by uh, our postdoc, Daniel Zurich, who's uh, managed to use these um, tracking points on the male's body from all these different angles, we were able to reconstruct a wireframe of his movements to see what he, how he was waving his arms, as well as calculate what that would look like from the position of the female, because we had that on the cameras as well. So when we look at what males are doing when their environment changes, are they adjusting their display in any way? We really expected that males might move more or when there's more movement in the background to try to increase that contrast or maybe move less. But we found that males actually don't change the amplitude of their display or their velocity across different visual environments. What they did was really surprising though, at least to us, males responded with positioning. So on the y-axis here, we have the distance between male and female, the communication distance between these two animals on the X, I apologize, I didn't mention before, the four different backgrounds that males experience. Males actually move closer to the female when things are more complicated. That means they're gonna appear, as a result of this, they are actually going to appear larger from the female's point of view. So the perceived movement, how big she is, or how big that male is within her field of view, as he moves closer, he becomes comparatively larger. And this is, uh, we see that when that, that is how males are responding to this environmental challenge. They're not responding with their signal, but with their positioning. And we also found that males respond to spatial information, so the distance from the female as well. So when, uh, again, now we have the distance between the two animals on the x-axis, and on the y, we have the amplitude of the male's display, how big of that movement it is. You might find this result really familiar when you are far away, you make a big movement. And when you're up close, you can wave more slowly. And yet this is, we have evidence of this in this jumping spider. And yet there's been, we actually don't have any evidence uh, or formal evidence of this at all in humans. It's an untested hypothesis. But we see that these animals are responding to distance and adjusting their display in a distance dependent way. So they are keeping track of their spatial environment how close they are to the female, as well as what's happening behind them and responding all during communication. And as a result of this behavior, again, the perceived movement that a female see, how big of that wave uh, appears in her field of view, uh, it's larger, it appears larger 
with uh, this um, adjustment that males do. So you see the, there's two curves here. The red line is the wave that was adjusted with distance. This is the real data plotted. And then the dotted um, blue line is a modeled version that assumes that males did not adjust what they were doing and they just stayed with a static wave throughout the entire um, communication interaction. We see that the um, adjusting, adjusting with distance makes you your signal appear larger to your target. We saw earlier that that might give you a priority in getting the female's attention, but there's also chances that um, that that might that size might be doing something to um, the, the perceived size might uh, tell be a, uh, excuse me might tell female something about the size of the male, as we would expect. A lot of animals have uh, use their extended arms to um, show how large they are as a measure of their body condition. So. This is another way that, that this behavior might help males. So that is um, just a hypothesis at the moment. So to review what we learned um, from this experiment, males can reliably control where a female is looking with their waving displays, even in complex environments, or at least they, they have a chance, a reliable chance of doing so. Um, and males are responding to their environmental conditions by adjusting, adjusting their position closer to the female so that their signals appear larger. Likewise, they are responding to the spatial information, the context of the, the positioning, they're responding to the position of the female and adjusting their signaling in response. <clears throat> and so, excuse me, um, let's have a sip of water. And so we see that communication depends not just on, um, or how animals position is not just on, uh, can be, or excuse me, how animals position themselves, as we just saw, can be affected by a signal that the male uses to control the positioning of the female. That's something that we, we can add to our understanding of, of um, how animals, how and why animals position themselves. Likewise, we see that there are environmental effects. So the, the environment that um, males are experiencing might affect, might interact with where they are in their environment. They might respond to that in order to increase the efficiency of their, their signaling. And this is something that we have evidence of in other systems that unfortunately I didn't have time to share with you, but if you have questions about that, I'm happy to talk about that afterwards. Um, as well as the other effect that we noticed that the distance between the two animals, which is of course affected by where they are relative to each other, is something that um, signalers can respond to in order to increase the effectiveness of their signals. And all of this can, will feed back into how animals position themselves and possibly how they change their signals, uh, as we saw here. Um, and so I would like to go back over the kind of three parts of my research and summarize what I've learned in the six years of studying this, this question. Um, so why does positioning matter? Well, as we saw, there's direct signals and sensors are directional. They work better in certain directions and others. Therefore, how animals position themselves relative to each other is gonna determine whether, what visual information can get across from point A to point B. And our next question of how animals position themselves, like what do we know about this at all? We find that at least in these jumping spiders, the assumption that we've been, that a lot of uh, scientists have been working on for many years, that it's completely shattered, that position, animals are moving around. They are both in, in like where they are, but also where they're looking. And most often we see that the receiver is looking away from the signal. And so most of the time, visual information is being lost and um, communication is inefficient, meaning that there are problems that signalers might need to respond to um, uh, with their behavior or over evolutionary time. And how might that be, um, how, how might signalers solve those issues? Well, signalers might have signals themselves that are designed 
to be attractive and visible to receivers and to control their positioning. And they might respond to the context of their communication. So where they are relative to the person they're talking to, what is in their environment and adjust their signaling strategies to increase efficacy from there. And hopefully this gets you thinking on a lot of questions because there's a lot of things that I wasn't able to cover just condensing this into one talk. Um, but there are a few things that have stayed with my mind both through writing my dissertation and, and in crafting this talk. And the first is I've talked about selection on positioning, but selection is something that acts based on the outcome of communication. So in courtship, how much does alignment or misalignment affect an, a, a male's likelihood of mating? Because that might be a way over that there is an evolutionary link between um, the efficiency of communication and selection over time for what males do. And we don't know what the strength of selection is on positioning. This is kind of a, another open question that I, I glossed over a bit is we don't know um, with this variation that we saw, which, how does it affect what, um, whether or not males are mating or in other contexts and other types of signaling situations. Um, like what, like, as I just mentioned, we saw that males varied in their ability to respond to female movement, to respond to the, the distance between the two, to respond to the visual environment. What is the basis of this variation? And is it something that could itself be informative to the female, to the receiver? Could a male's ability um, actually be almost a sig ability to respond to spatial information be a signal itself? So just to remind you, we saw that some males almost got all the way up into the females, um, the front of the female, while others stayed in place. Some males responded uh, drastically to, uh, um, moved a lot closer to the females in complex environments, and some clearly didn't. There's a big wide spread of that distribution. Why is that? And is there something about this that females are using to make decisions about males? This idea of social skill is something that's been brought up by um, uh, Andy C before, and we've considered, it's been kind of thought of how animals, how well animals can handle different situations, or especially social situations. But here, uh, this is not just a social situation, it's not just how you respond to a female, it's how you respond to where a female is. Um, and you can imagine, doing this while you are also doing a complex dance and singing through vibrations in the ground, which I didn't even mention, might be taxing on the cognitive system of a spider that is that big. Um, and their brain is, I can't physically do that. And so the, their ability to do this might actually be limited and therefore show something about them. This is, all, this is speculative, but it is where my mind has really gone to in the last six years of doing this research is I really want to know, you know, what are the, what might males ability to do, the, to do this, how well of a communicator they are, how well they can read the crowd and respond appropriately might be something that is also under selection in addition to how fast he dances or how well he sings. Um, and I want to leave off uh, with uh, both a an observation and a challenge um, and that is returning to this diversity of animals that we see in the world and that I couldn't possibly cover here um, or in the or even some of the things that we do know about them in the talk I've just told you about how this happens in one jumping spider what about other animals that have different limitations on their vision that have, what about animals that are communicating in different modalities? Some of that I have some answers for. If you have questions about other systems, um, I wasn't able to fit them in the main talk, but maybe questions. But there are a lot of, there are a lot of unknowns out there. Um, and hopefully that means that there's going to be a lot of future research in this field because I am really curious about how often animals actually see what we think they're seeing, how often they uh, actually can communicate effectively. Um, and so with that, 
I want to say thank you so much for um, listening to my research and taking the time to uh, spend here with me today. Before we take any questions, I absolutely need to thank some very important people that helped me get to where I am today um, that I would not be here without. And the first of those and to who I am dedicating my PhD is my mom, uh, Julia Becerra. She came here to the United States from Colombia with me when, we were, when I was a kid um, and has always been working so hard to, to both make sure that I had a fun life and to give me the access to education educational opportunities that I would never have had otherwise. This is a person who, when I said, hey, I don't want to go to school today, I want to watch nature documentaries all day, was like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say that's fine. And then I watched Crocodile Hunter all day, and it was amazing. Um, and I was growing up in New York City, so that was a lot of my connection to nature. Um, but beyond that, my mom has helped me really dive into education and appreciate it get from helping me get into an excellent public high school in new york city to college helping me pay for college um and helping me navigate being in the stress ball that is a phd program and that isn't to say that she hasn't also completely uh one upped me in the time that's taken me to to um uh actually give my, uh, to actually do my PhD research. She has written not only a novel about a, um, a friend who was captured by guerrillas in Colombia and held hostage, and the untold story behind that person's family, but also a children's book about conservation um, and the wonders of the natural world. And I am so incredibly proud of her and all the things that she does every day to um, even now help my life move forward. So I want to say thank you, gracias. Um, and I do have to also thank the other most important woman in my life, uh, my partner, Stella Chung, who has quite literally been here with me the entire journey. And I say that because our six year anniversary is literally tomorrow. Um, she has been a source of joy and happiness when grad school thought that I couldn't have those things. Um, I am so lucky to know you, Stella, and to have you in my life and to travel the world um, and just spend any and all time with you. Um, I also want to say thank you to the rest of my family, my dad, my grandmother, my aunts, including Molly, but others who I didn't have pictures of readily available. Um, I want to say thank you to my friends here, especially Melissa and Douglas and Elizabeth and Sam. You have been like the best uh, PhD crew support system, board game night escape room friends I could ask for, fellow Terrace House watchers. I, I don't know where I'd be without, without y'all. Um, and that, of course, leaves me to thank my scientific support, um, the Morehouse Lab, the lab that I joined. Nate didn't mention this. Um, he's the person who got me into spiders. Before I met Nate and before that interview that in that dark room in the cellar of like a labyrinthine basement, I knew nothing about spiders. I thought birds were the coolest thing ever. Like five minutes into talking to Nate, he shows me a video of a jumping spider baby with its eyes moving independently inside of its head. Yeah, I didn't mention that. They can do that. Um, and then a courtship dance. And if I recall correctly, I literally stood up from my chair and said, this is the coolest thing ever. And I have Nate to thank for the fact that I now realize that spiders are literally the best animal um, and that I have the chance to tell people how cool they are and help them realize that. Um, the rest of the Morehouse Lab has been there through Halloweens, through lab meetings, um, 
I especially want to thank our undergraduates who did so much work on this project and particularly to Daniel Zurich, my partner in crime for multiple field seasons who put up with me making really silly images to promote our field seasons um, <laughs> and traveling together for months across the American Southwest to catch rare and new jumping spiders and uh, catalog their environments, record data. Thank you for joining me uh, and teaching me. Um, honestly, how to do macro photography, which is one of my favorite things to do now. Um, and that, of course, brings me to my other lab family. I am lucky enough to have not one, but two labs in my life. The Richard Zawaki lab has been there for me when I thought I was going to, just my dissertation was going to collapse. Um, there was a year where I had a completely different project that some of you may remember from an old moon seminar on the ontogeny of color vision in frogs that I spent literally a year working on and Corey was there every step of the way and Yusan and Kim and all the other lab members helping me learn what a frog is and how their eyes work and how I might study that and working as hard as I can giving me the resources to do that supporting me through all the many failures and then always being there for me and saying no well you've got some more research in you you can finish your PhD um, there have been so many times that that talking to Corey and to Nate have been the only reasons that I've been able to write that next sentence or make that next slide or just see a way that I can finish this. Um, and so to them and to everyone in the Richard Zawaki lab, I wanted to say thank you. Um, and finally, just to break it down by teams, geometry team, geometry of signaling team, started as a review paper in a class and we we did a lot the uh our alignment team looking at how animals position themselves full of amazing undergraduates treadball team looking at how signalers can control the positions of receivers a amazing special shout out to nathan brower the stats wizard who helped me learn gener generalized linear mixed models now the only type of advanced stats that I know, but I, I damn well do know it. Um, my committee members, Walt, Tia Lynn, Mark, uh, for guiding me throughout this process. Um, and uh, also being there for me when things crashed and burned and I had to find a new project and develop something new. Um, the department at Pitt that has been a wonderful support. Um, uh, Jeffrey Lawrence, Kathy Barr, Pat Dean, Dave Malicki, who keeps the light on, lights on. My fellow six years, which I think I might be the, well, I'm, I'm I, last E&E &E one, I think. Um, and so, oh, James is, is in a different school, but to all of y'all who've been in this for the same time as me, been through it together, y'all are an inspiration. I don't know uh, how I did this, but I knew that all of you would. And finally, our funding sources. This work has been funded by Pitt, uh, NSF, uh, Experiment.com, which is a crowdfunding site. Um, the Mellon Foundation and Sigma Xi have all contributed uh, money to supporting me and my research. And finally, I want to end with um, just a fundamental truth about animals. Jumping spiders are the best. And I will uh, take your questions now if you have them. Um, and maybe I need to stop sharing to do that. But thank you very much. It's very hard to tell what's happening when everyone's muted. Um. <laughs> Great. So awesome, Sebastian. So I think the, the plan was to use the chat feature. Yes. Sebastian to oh, I see that. I see Ooh. questions. Yes. So there's a lot of comments and only a few questions in here. So you'll have to kind of wade through if you can see them. Um, let's see. Um, a lot of wonderful supportive comments. Um, <laughs> I see MCDP still up in there. Y'all are going to make it. Um, <laughs> uh, if anyone has any questions about spiders, communication, all the types of modalities that I didn't get the chance to talk about, I have slides, I have things to talk about. Happy to answer anything. Um, 
just type it out in the chat. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the low ball question. David Morris asks, what is my favorite uh, Habernatus jumping spider? Um, like, I mean, Habernatus pyrethrix is the one I know the most about. Like, they, they are, they're amazing, right? Like, I, I've spent my life with these guys. Um, but the, I like the really weird ones. I like um, Decorus, which uses its butt as a shiny pink mirror to sim signal. And then I like, um, God, the one that, uh, I think it's, it's not Signatus, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the sand species that actually the males and females, they don't do a dance separate from each other. The males and females actually touch and they waltz. Um, they live in the great sand dunes and it was an honor to see them. It is, I have no idea what's happening in the communication there. Super weird, and I love it. Wish any more. Um, thank you. Question from Shakira. Do these spiders have multimodal communication? Do they use vibratory signals as well? Yes, they do. So I mentioned it really briefly. Um, jumping spiders, especially Habernatus, uh, they sing as they dance. So the males will vibrate their abdomen against the ground and that transmits a uh, vibrational song to the female. And these are actually coordinated with their dance movements. So it's this whole orchestral performance. And that is, in our studies, we actually used a heavy steel drum to isolate just the visual component so they weren't able to vibrate it, specifically so that we could just see what's going on with, with their uh, visual communication. But in the wild, it's very possible that they are using vibration as another way, possibly, to get to tell a female, hey, I'm over here, you can look at me. Because that vibrational communication is likely, she'll feel it, they feel it through their legs to the ground. She'll be able to feel that no matter where the male is and it'll give her, give her accurate information about where he is. Um, thank you for that question. Yeah, so that they use these vibratory signals. There's a lot of really interesting work on that coming from Damien Elias' lab that would, anyone interested should check out because it's like the coolest stuff. Um, and it could be something that is used in controlling how they position themselves. Um, question from Michelle Spicer. Do you think females are assessing the quality of mates when looking at them and that's why they turn away? So yeah, that, that's, I, I don't know. So, they, you're, so are you asking whether females look at a male and they're like, okay, he's not, he's not worth it. I'm just gonna go back to doing other things. Um, I yeah. certainly think that it's possible um, if it's, if, it, if that information is simple enough that she can make a snap judgment about him. Um, we do know that males in the experiments that we did, they would continue to court and the male would, the females would allow them to continue courtship for a very long time. We ended it after 15 minutes, but some were happy to keep going afterwards. So it's not that she like left entirely. Um, I think that there's two hypotheses that I, that I personally think might be going on. One is that um, females have other things to look at. <laughs> there are predators and there are prey that could be seen in the environment. And the same directional challenges apply to looking for those cues as well as looking to males. And so she might be splitting her attention based on these different things. So this hypothesis would predict that if females are satiated or they know that they're in a low predation risk environment, they might actually be more attentive because that that um, those other tasks are no longer as critical. That's something that I'm really interested in testing. And the other thing could be that the one that I think that I, it might be possible that she might actually be like, I'm gonna turn away, let me see what you do. So this idea that she might be evaluating yes. how he responds, <laughs> right? Like a, it, this kind of dialogue that we see in, in some vocal communication in some animals where there's like this duetting of like, okay, how well do we match up? This could be another thing. Okay, I'm gonna look over there, can you, can you get some get my attention back? Well, maybe that means it's you're you're a, a quality male. Cool. Um, I I just have like a little follow up question yeah. from that. Um, thanks for that. Um, do you think they can also? And this is just like kind of naive in that I don't actually understand how their vision works that well. Can mm -hmm. you? Can they assess the difference between like, especially in environments where the males are moving closer mm -hmm. to like appear bigger? How yeah. do they figure out if it's actually like maybe a more fit or a bigger male versus yeah. like a male that's signaling closer to kind of yeah. compensate for that? And maybe could smaller males that are more active or they're more dynamic that could move faster? Is that like a way that they can get around being maybe a smaller male? Could that that's, be like an advantage or something? 
Yeah, that's that that's uh that's definitely possible. So the, the, Jemmings was talking about distance perception. They mm-hmm. they um have couple mechanisms like we do. They have binocular vision, so they can look at the difference between two objects. And I believe they also use um the amount of image defocus on their their tiers of retinas to tell away tell how far apart something is. I hope I'm not loving that right now, but they have multiple ways of doing so. So they can get distance information that is independent of the size of the movement, but whether or not they females actually combine those two pieces of information to make a choice, or they just look at how big is this movement, um, or maybe it helps a little bit. That could be something that um, you might see a size difference, and yeah, that might let smaller males um, mate. It, a exciting possibility, but I unfortunately don't have data for you to answer it. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Great Michelle. Time. Thank you. Um, follow up questions next. So, Catherine asks um, Females seem to be turning random. When they seem to be turning random, do you think she could be orienting in such a way to better hear the male? Okay, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so, what is the directionality of sound in this system? Because sound signals. Um, our ears are, for us, it's pretty obvious. Our ears are little radar dishes. You turn your ear towards something, it funnels sound and amplifies it into your ear canal. You hear better when you put your ear towards something. Jumping spider um, communication, at least the vibrational communication, is through the ground. And so females detect that with the, the contact of their legs to the ground. And so she should be able to hear him as long as she has like legs, you know, kind of facing him, which with the four legs she often does. Um, it's possible that having, if you, it's because each leg is an independent sound detector by aligning them so that they like are either pa- maybe perpendicular to the, the travel of the, the vibrational wave, she might get some information of how much that, uh, vibration is decaying at each leg, and therefore, how much energy did he put into the vibration? Theoretically, that's possible. Um, it would be a wonderful question for uh, some of the really cool researchers who study the vibrational communication of these spiders, because unfortunately, I don't have the the data or the physiology to nail down whether or not that's the case, but it's definitely a cool possibility. Um, and yeah, there's some weird, interesting things about sound directionality that we could get into, but that's a whole rant rabbit hole. And I'm going to answer the question. Do you, did you have a follow-up question that answer your question? Okay, cool. Um, uh, question from Kira. Hey, Kira. Um, long time no see. Uh, do you think males are moving closer during courtship to in- are increasing the chances of getting it eaten? Would that explain some degree of misalignment being maintained? Yes, I think this is a, this is a, thank you for bringing that up because that is something that we've talked about a few times. Um, it hasn't been at the forefront of my mind because I'm always thinking about efficacy, but another thing that is directional in jumping spiders is their attack ability. So just spiders jump forward, jumping spiders jump forward. Uh, and so if you're in front of a female, um, she can jump at you and, and she's looking at you, she can jump at you and then she eats you, which is bad. Um, and so there might be some selection to be like at the border and like kind of just like dip in and see like, hey, oh, here's my red. Okay, I'm just going to stay a little bit out of like the, the gun barrel, um, which is, uh, I think we didn't have any instances of cannibalism in the trials that we did, but um, other research has seen that. And it does def- depend on like how well fed females are. Ours were pretty well fed. Um, but we did see females sometimes lunge at males to deter them. Um, and I have seen instances of males, um, females will swivel or sometimes he just wanders in front of field of view and then he will back out and like re-enter. And so the males will sometimes, um, though it's a rarer event than just looking at her and trying to, to dance at her, they will sometimes, when they see that she's looking at them, actually back off to the side. Um, so that could be another selective pressure that's going into positioning, which we didn't talk about at all, about uh, avoiding death. Definitely a, a, an interesting possibility um, that I think I think actually has a lo- probably a lot of merit to it. Um, did that answer your question? I don't, I can't, there's so many people I can't see you because uh, it's just, it, the, the like 
people goes, okay, you gave a thumbs up. Cool. Um, next question. Angela asks, do does female positioning or alignment predict mating interest or success? Are females that turn away, never focus on males, more likely to reject the males and eat them? This is the question that I want to know in these jumping spiders. Um, there is some evidence in other jumping spiders, the peacock jumping spiders, Maratus, that one of the predictors of mating success is how long a female looks at a male. Um, and so there is likely, or at least in that other jumping spider system that's analogous and that they have really diverse colorful signals, um, that could be what's going on is that there's, and that is a, a kind of, it's called the looking time or gaze par paradigm in animal communication. The idea that the more you look at something, the more interested in, in it you are. Um, and often there's some evidence that in other animals um, that might lead to uh, increased like likelihood to, to mate. So I think that um, we, our, uh, our trials in the, what I showed you, the experience only went to 15 minutes. And so um, courtship can last like hours, uh, like an hour straight of dancing. Um, so we didn't actually go to the court, to the copulation attempt phase um, for that. And so that, I unfortunately don't have the data to answer your question, but I think that there is good evidence that that may be the case. Um, and maybe that's something, another reason that males are trying to get females to look at her because there is some association between I'm, I'm looking at this thing a lot okay i like it cool um but yeah thank you for that great question um okay next uh cassie asks how often is the cost to not successfully capturing attention of a female lost a lost mating opportunity versus loss of life to cannibalism so what is the cannibalism rate of these animals and how does it relate to attention um, the cannibalism rate varies. Um, I know in, like I said, in our studies uh, or in our experiments, um, we had no, we had females lunge at males and males like, they, they'd like ejector boost off the arena. Um, so we didn't have any captured males, but we had attacks. And unfortunately, I don't have the rate of attack for you. It really is going to depend a lot on how hungry that female is and whether or not she's already mated because if she has already made it, she's probably less interested in the male and isn't, she has enough sperm to fertilize all her eggs. And so it's more of a walking sandwich than something more interesting. Um, so let me go over your question. Um, uh, again, to make sure I got it. Um, what, yeah, what is the relative cost of the two? Um, that's one of the questions that I have. So we, there's studies on cannibalism rates just in general courtship in these spiders by Lisa Taylor's lab. Um, and I apologize that I don't have the number off the top of my head. Um, but the correlation between that and how, how often females are looking at males, how often signal alignment is happening is, um, as far as I know, we don't have that connection yet. But it is, if there are videos of top down of those things, we can calculate it. And if not, the experiments to do so would be a relatively simple thing um, to both run and could be a fun project for a small like summer research thing in the future that I'm very curious about that too. So again, this question of selection, what is the actual selective impact? Um, but thank you for the question. Did I answer? Do you have a follow-up question? Yeah, that was great. Thank you, Sebastian. Okay, thanks, Cassie. Um, Alec asks if I've seen the research on some of the University of Florida folks are doing in multimodal communication and misalignment in Schizocosa retrosa. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah, I, I guess I did just mention it. Yeah, so there, th this, the, the really exciting thing about animal communication right now is that the reason that I was able to do a review paper on this is that other people are starting to look at it. So I didn't get the chance to talk about um, some of the other systems where we started to poke away at these connections. But thankfully, it is an idea that is now becoming more and more common. So there are, are people looking at it in a variety of systems, including some other jumping spiders, or some other spiders. Um, let's see, other questions. Uh, Dr. Cesar Perez asks, um, could, they, could females be testing the level of interest on the male's part? I think that's, I will say 
the only time I have seen a male not be interested in courting a female was not when it was a dead female on a stick. It was not when it was a decaying dead female on a stick. It was the only time was when I tried to make a tiny little model of a jumping spider to replace the dead females on a stick because you have to kill the females. And it looks barely like a jumping spider. And we saw males like look at it and be like, and then they'd stop dancing and go away. But really, if there's anything that looks like a Habronatus jumping spider, like possibly a female Habronatus jumping spider, doesn't matter the species, males are just going to dance. They're just going to dance. They're going to go until they are stopped. Um, there's a lot of hybridization that has some really interesting uh, effects on signals, like ornaments, because they are actually been transferred between different phylogenetic groups through hybridization. Um, because males are always interested, always. I've seen a male that was so old that he could, he, only one of his arms could wave. Still tried to dance. Did not go well, but he still tried. Um, we did not include him in the data set because reasons. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's testing male's interest. It might be testing how persistent a male might be in, in in dealing with the fact that she's looking away. That might be something, but he's always interested, as far as I know. Um, okay, uh, Corey is cutting off the questions. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll really quick answer Jack's question of do drag lines play a role in courtship? Yes, males follow the silk drag lines. Um, they are uh, an indicator of, of a female's previous path. And so when they find them, they will follow them. They will taste it to get information about the female's um, uh, mating status and her age and they will follow it and then uh, find the female, hopefully at the end of the drag line, and then start dancing. And they, they, they will just dance wherever they find the female, anytime when they're active. Um, okay, we're cutting off questions. So I wanna say thank you for all those wonderful questions. I really like talking about spiders. So thank you for letting me talk about spiders. <laughs>